Hi, and welcome to another episode of Found, a conversation at the intersection of Christian faith and culture, where we always aim to find Jesus in the way we react and respond to our world. I'm Linda Tokar, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Brandon Bathauer. Now, in this episode, we are going to be looking at the idea that the world is broken, and we're asking the question, what can we do about it? How can we engage with this broken world? This is what spouts from the lips of celebrities and philanthropists and activists, right? We need to make this world a better place. We cannot be the entirety of the solution if we are part of the problem. This passage reminds us is that the world and our relationship is not, it's not irreconcilable, such that the only option is just to destroy it. We're not to abandon the world, but the way that we live in the world, by that, we become these agents of reconciliation. So what do we do in this in-between? What's going on right now in this saving project that Jesus has done? When we realize we're not the ones to save the world, Jesus is going to save it then we get to walk into these areas where we want to see change and we get to do it without the weight on our shoulders that we're doing it on our own. And we get to do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Exactly. God is at work in this world and he loves you and he wants to make things right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be a part of that. I'm going to be a herald of his making right work right now. Hey, welcome to episode two. Hey, Brandon, how are you? I am doing splendidly. How are you doing, Linda? Excited. I'm excited. We've worked hard on this one, so I'm excited to share it. It has been a month of work and lots (laughs) of good research and some (laughs) wonderful goodness. Well, we are so excited for this second episode. And before we jump in, we just want to briefly remind our listeners kind of who we are and why we're here. Um, Brandon and I work together on the spiritual growth team here at Saddleback Lake Forest. And through years of both studying and teaching God's word, what we've observed is that most of the time, The communication of spiritual or biblical truth is one way and one sided. The teacher or preacher kind of tells you what's true and what you should think about it. And you either agree or you don't. What we want to do here on Found is actually create room for dialogue. We want to explore these truths from different angles. And ultimately, we want to say, what does Jesus actually say about these things? Yeah, it's been so, so fun digging into this. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everybody for for your feedback on episode one. It was really, really helpful um, man, we got into a lot of discussions about truth in the hallways <laughs> and on the weekend after church. It was really fantastic. Thank you so much for, for listening and for the encouragement. Um, hey, and quick note, I, I used a Spanish uh, <laughs> phrase of ser versus um, uh, conocer, and ser is not the, the right word. It's saber. So totally my bad for all the Spanish speakers out there that were like this this dude what has no idea. Four years of high school Spanish right? did nothing for me. So uh, anyway, thank you so much, though, for, for engaging. And, uh, and hey, with a second episode, uh, they will now let you review the podcast, which is kind of nice. So right. you actually have to listen to two of them before or like just glimpses of two of them before you can actually review. So now we have our second. Woo-hoo. Jump on there. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's jump into today's topic. So, you know, as we thought about this, there are, there are some things that we just don't have to be told. Some things that are as evident that just as we look around us that are part of the human experience. And one of those things is the fact that the world does not work the way that it's supposed to. A quick review of headlines on any given day reveals suffering or racism, war, greed, oppression, fear, pain, and it's happening all around the world. No one is immune to the brokenness in the world around us. Even those who seem to be escaping it, if you could peek behind the curtain, you'd find that they too are dealing with really hard stuff. They just hide it better than others. And with the exception of a few sort of fringe philosophers, most people can agree that the world doesn't work the way it should. We yearn for justice and beauty and truth. We have this internal sense that there must be a way to make things better. It's the sense of ought, that things ought to work better than this, or this kind of suffering ought not exist. But as we look around, things are just not that way, not at all. (laughs) So this leads us to two questions that we're going to be digging into today. Number one, what's really wrong with the world? And number two, what can we do about it? 
But before we jump into the exercise, I just want to be sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to the terms that we're using. And specifically when we talk about the world, what do we mean? Well, there's the natural world. You might call it the physical world. There's humanity, which is all of us. And then there's what people produce, culture, art, sciences, media. There's just ways of engaging, interacting, thinking, and being in the world. So that's kind of what we're focused on, just all of it. (laughs) Ed Stetzer wrote a book called Subversive Kingdom, and he kind of summed up this brokenness beautifully. And this is what he said. He said, look around. Our world is broken. I'm not talking about the world in terms of nature, although creation too bears the marks of sin's blemish and decay. I'm talking about the world comprised of the people, structures, and systems that make up society, the moral patterns, beliefs, and behaviors that result in things like unfair business practices, racism, extreme poverty, dishonest government, dirty politics, family breakdown, cheating, stealing, oppression of the weak, and so many other distressors and defilers. He writes, it stinks, it's bad, it's not right, it's broken. And in homes and hospitals every day of the week, at courthouses and gravesides everywhere in the world, people of all spiritual makes and models suffer from it, from a world that toils along in hopeless disrepair. Now, theologians call this generally the problem of evil, but it's not just theologians who discuss it and try to figure out how to respond to it. We all see it. The question isn't, is there a problem? The question is, what is at the root of the problem? And what, if anything, can we do about it? And with that, let's jump into the exercise. Brandon, take it away. Yeah, so again, what we want to do on this podcast is wrestle with these ideas. And again, like Linda was saying, there's this tendency to say, uh, hey, here's the idea, take it or leave it. And uh, here's kind of the propositional truth, and you either just accept it or deny it. And we learn that it's actually, it's when we wrestle with these things, Mm -hmm. when we dig it out of the ground ourselves with our own hands, that it actually becomes a part of us. That's when it really matters. And so what the exercise is about is kind of looking at different streams of thought that are around us. We, We look at mainstream culture and say, okay, how would mainstream culture, this this reality, this water that we're swimming in. When you're at the coffee house and you hear something brought up Mm -hmm. at the table next to you because you're eavesdropping like I do, (laughs) what is just generally going to be the response? Um, And then we kind of hold that intention with, okay, what what would what we're calling churchianity say? And churchianity would be kind of the culture that the church can create over time that doesn't necessarily have to do with Jesus, but it's kind of its own micro culture. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the kind of culture that the Pharisees created a church culture that people go, no, thank you. I don't, I don't want to be a part of anything that has to do with religion because of that right. stuff. We're just titling that all churchianity. And then we want to then say, okay, after we've held these points of view, uh, kind of intention a little bit as we've dug into them, what would Jesus have to say? And I hope you've experienced in in the last episode and in this one that when you wrestle with things this way, by the time you come to Jesus, the light and the beauty and the goodness of what he had to say, you go, oh man, I I wouldn't have seen it with that shade or that nuance Mm -hmm. or from that perspective had I not kind of wrestled with it a little bit first. And so that's why we're going to walk through this exercise. And um, with that, let's jump into mainstream culture. So mainstream culture responds to this claim by saying the world is broken, but we can fix it. Right. So mainstream culture, there are so many micro cultures and philosophies in mainstream culture. And look, we could get super academic here and break into all of them. And this would be about a six hour podcast. We don't (laughs) want to do that to you. So what we're trying to summarize here is what is the pervasive kind of point of view um, that that flows around that we're all swimming in. And as we talked with people, as we did some research, it was kind of like, yeah, this is kind of it. We generally mainstream culture would say, yeah, the world is broken. There's not a lot of disagreeing about that. Um, but the, the solution to it is, Hey, we, we can fix this. Right. Uh, we're on our own here and we can make the world a better place. And so think about phrases like, we can make things better or be the change you want to see. Um, these are hopeful 
and optimistic ideas. They they feel good. They they build us up, and no one's going to really disagree with that, right? right? These are the phrases that you hear in feel good commercials. This is what spouts from the lips of celebrities and philanthropists and activists, right? We need to make this world a better place. This is what is taught to our kids in school Mm -hmm. as kind of the basis of ethics. Um, You know, if you see that piece of trash on the ground, pick it up, throw it away, like be a part of of making the world better. Now, what we want to do in this section is to is to really dig down into, okay, what are the roots Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of this culture that we're a part of? You know, the water that we're swimming in, you know, you're swimming in this lake or whatever, sometimes it's helpful to pull some of the water out into kind of a test tube and look at it under a microscope, and it will help you realize, are there some things in this that I don't really want to get into my system? (laughs) (laughs) Or, hey, are there some really good nutrients in this that I, I do want to enjoy, but Sometimes we, we, we just don't take the time to, to dive into it. And so hopefully this is a place where we can do that, where you'll hear kind of the common language and stuff from the media a little bit differently. And you go, oh, I know what's beneath that. I know the thinkers and the philosophies beneath that. So as we were wrestling with this point of view of the world is broken, but we can fix it. We have the power to, to, to fix this and make it better. I think really the the philosophy that this came from is humanism, Mm -hmm. specifically secular humanism. So I want to kind of give a little bit of background about where this came from, who are some of the thinkers behind it, and how it has influenced this this point of view. So secular humanism is a worldview or philosophy that builds its views largely from Greek and Roman philosophers, believing that our logic and our reason... um, can make the world better, that if we apply our thinking and our, uh, our behaviors, we can make government better, we can make uh, us better, we can make the world a better place. Now, uh, if you're a little history geek like me, here's the story. About 300 years before Jesus, you had the dude Plato, okay? So he's this Greek philosopher, and um, he is writing down a bunch of stuff that his mentor, Socrates, Uh, wrote. And so they're working together and they're thinking about, okay, what is our part to play in the world? And how do we make the world a better place? Now, they believed in God and some metaphysical realm. Um, They believed that there was supernatural. So they hadn't cut that out at all. In fact, that was really influential in what they thought of what was right, what was moral, what was just. Now, they wrote a bunch of stuff and, uh, and then the Roman Empire kind of continued to grow in strength. And after the Roman Empire fell, Mm -hmm. we went into what's called the Dark Ages or the Medieval Period. And as you could tell by the name Dark Ages, (laughs) (laughs) there are parts of it that weren't great. The the bubonic plague wiped out large percentages of the population. There were wars and kind of all of the civilization that was built around the Roman Empire fell apart. Now, the smartest people um, were monks, at that time. Mm-hmm. They were the ones that had done the most research and what they were focused on during this time were lots of questions about God. Mm-hmm. Um, these were Christian theologians that were trying to figure out the divinity of Jesus and how can he be all man and all God and digging into all this stuff, right? Now that continued on for a long time until the questions they were asking were like, how many angels can you fit on the head <laughs> of a pin? That literally was a big question yeah. that they were wrestling with. And meanwhile, you got all these people that are living in like barely surviving and trying to get by. And so there was this kind of revival of saying, that's great. We can be asking those questions, but what are we supposed to do as humans? Like, what is our part to play in this? How is this applicable at all? And so uh, at this time, this was about the 1400s. Um, so imagine we're moving out of medieval times. People don't wear the armor, you know, on horses as much anymore. And um, in Italy, there was this group of people that found these old documents, these things from Plato and from Socrates and from Aristotle and Cicero. And they were like, whoa, this is super helpful. <laughs> Look what we can do together. Like, this is so great. We as humans can understand how governments can work and what how we should live and what is right and what is wrong. And 
so they were really ca- captured by this, and this really is what started the Renaissance, mm-hmm. right? So hopefully some of you are like, oh, yeah, Renaissance. Renaissance. I remember high, high school. school. History. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully this is more exciting than high school history for you. Um, but here's what ends up happening. That becomes this sense of like, what is, how can we apply these truths to our lives? That is what humanism became. This is what we call the humanities, right? When you mm-hmm. go to school and you study humanities, what is that? That's literature and art and science and all of these wonderful things that kind of flowed out from this time. And these people that first kind of started up the Renaissance, these were Christians. In fact, mm-hmm. this viewpoint is what really led into the Protestant Reformation. Now, as time went on, fast forward now to the 1900s, Uh, We've got all these factories, the industrial revolution has happened, and people are realizing, we don't need to keep talking about God all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we talk about God, we have all these different religions, and it just makes things feel awkward. So let's just stop focusing on God. In fact, let's stop talking about God. In fact, there is no God. Mm -hmm. And so, but let's hold on to these, these humanistic kind of points of view. Sure. Let's keep moving forward on that. And so this is where we are right now in, in this humanist, secular humanist viewpoint that says we're on our own in the world and we need to use reason and logic and techno- technological advancement to make the world a better place because guess what? We are totally, totally alone. See, it says it right here um, uh, in the Humanist Manifesto. It was written in 1973. It says... No God will save us. We must save ourselves. Right? So this is why we dig into some of these cultural things. As we say, we start with like, yeah, make the world a better place. That's great. But as you start (laughs) digging deeper and deeper into the roots, you go, okay. Mm -hmm. So this philosophy that says, be the change you want to see, often comes from a viewpoint that says, well, God's not really involved. Right. If God exists at all. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just up to us. And what's the solution? The first principle of secular humanism says we are committed to the application of reason and science to the understanding of the universe and to the solving of human problems. So if you think about that, the way that this plays out then, the, um, the, the point of view here is, man, if we can just elect that new, that, that right governor or president or Mm -hmm. congressman or congresswoman if we can just you know get more money into that charitable foundation if we can just educate people enough well then the world is going to be better Mm -hmm. like it's just we our our shared efforts can make the world better we can solve this problem of things being broken Mm-hmm. So we're going to trust science. We're going to do it. And look, if I make a mistake, no worries. I'm just going to learn from it. Uh, Epictetus, who is an old Greek philosopher, said, whenever you have a mishap, remember to ask yourself how you can make use of it. And, you know, Michael Jackson says, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. You see, that philosopher I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Yeah, so, right. The viewpoint here is the world's just going to keep getting better. Mm -hmm. And by the shared effort of all of us, if we can just get rid of that bad governance, bring in something good, write the right laws, um, if we can educate people enough, if we can uh, just try hard enough with science and technology, the world's just going to keep getting better and better and better until it's not broken anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's... Secular humanism, that's this viewpoint that says the world is broken. How can I make, uh, we, uh, but we can fix it. Sure. Okay. So what are the benefits of how this viewpoint plays out? First off, it, it names reality, right? Yeah. There is brokenness in this world. We all sense it to be wrong and we want it to be made right. This is the heart of most activists today. Sure. There's something that isn't right and it needs to be made right. There is an ought to the world and we are not in the ought, right? Yes. That's fun. Yeah, I know. I, like I felt it. all right. Okay. Uh, it also is hopeful. Right. It, it realizes that humans can make a change. We do have the ability to bring good. We do have an impact, however small. Um, we have a part to play in how this world functions. And 
you know, another benefit of this is that laws and, and these, um, these ways of innovating and progressing as a society, like they, they do and can make things better. Mm-hmm. So I had a super early morning, uh, <laughs> early meeting this morning. And, uh, I sat seriously in about eight red lights on my way to work today. Yeah. The, the more you need to get somewhere, the more red lights you it's, will sit at. It's a strange brokenness of the universe. Yes. yes. <laughs> there it is. Nailed it. <laughs> so here's what I was thinking. I was looking around and is everyone in a rush? Of course, everyone is a rush. Everybody has to get where, to where they're going. And you look around the intersection and yet these lawless people were all selfish, you know, we're all sitting there sitting at a, at a light, this darn red light that's just telling us to sit and wait. And somehow the laws that we've in place, the ways that we've enforced that with, man, you'll get a ticket. You got to pay a little bit of money or whatever. If you run this red light for some, somehow our laws and our progress as society ended up with people will just generally sit at a red light. That's crazy. That is progress as humans. You know, you think back to the Wild West, that would not happen. People would be, you know, thrown off of horses and stuff. Uh, Polio, right? This, like, terrible disease through vaccinations, like, dunzo. Right. That's amazing. So that sometimes does happen. And... You know, one, uh, I think a huge positive thing that comes out of this is something that you actually see, I think, in a lot in the younger generations. Um, I say younger. My generation and younger <laughs> often is that they, it fights the tendencies of human culture to just get caught up in what I think to be the more, like, shallow end goals. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not just going to chase my own comfort. I'm not just going to want to work my way up the corporate ladder so I can have more money or influence or whatever. Um like I actually am driven to want to make the world better. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is really a beautiful thing. You know, to be fair, some of us, let's be honest, some of us millennials and Gen Zers will like post a picture on Instagram about Earth Day thinking that that's going to suddenly like raise gardens all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Our activism sometimes is pretty shallow, but at least there's this desire to want to make things right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's some good in this. I, I think there are some challenges to this point of view. Mm-hmm. I, I think the main challenge to this point of view is it just does not cover the depth of the world's brokenness. The idea of like, just look in the mirror and make a change. It doesn't encapsulate the brutality of human genocide. Sure. You know, so there are certain darknesses about this world and the evil of this world that the kind of Pollyanna, optimistic, you can just try a little bit harder. It just doesn't solve it, right? right? I mean, we've seen that with so many, so many things in our culture, even today, where it's like, you can't just educate some of this stuff away or inform it away. It's like, Mm -hmm. you still see people struggling with it. Generations. I mean, I'm thinking about even some of the racial stuff that goes on and, and you just can't legislate and educate it away. There's, there's something deeper that yes. needs to be addressed. Yeah, there's this deep intrinsic brokenness that, yeah, that new curriculum is yeah. not going to suddenly end racism, you know, in the South. Like, it's not going to do that. Right. Um, and no matter how many times we try, it's not going to quite get there. Uh, the It kind of, this viewpoint, I think it treats the wound mm-hmm. without naming the disease. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? It's kind of like that story of like the starfish, you know, that are washed up on the shore and like I threw one back and it says, well, it mattered to him. You know, it's like, well, I'm going to throw a starfish back. It's not going to solve the problem of why all these starfish are going to die right now, but <laughs> it makes me feel better. Mm-hmm. The, I, I think logically, uh, and this is the problem with secular humanism, is you're like, well, you know, you've got to use logic. The logic is if we humans are a part of the problem, and we are on our own to be the entirety of the solution. That does not equal out. Mm-mm. That like mm-hmm. we cannot be the entirety of the solution if we are part of the problem. And look, we can't overlook all of the accomplishments. Sure. I took a warm shower today, and that was glorious. That mm-hmm. was thanks to technology and technological advancement. Right now, if we think about what it would take to send this podcast uh, around the world let's say 50 years ago, we would need distributors and VHS things, cassette tapes and all this stuff to send. Right now, because of technology, this can reach the world. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. 
But at the same time, some of our greatest accomplishments in the 1900s also um, were kind of paired up with the most murderous century in recorded mm-hmm. history. Uh, the total number of deaths in the 1900s caused or associated with wars is about 187 million people. That's about 10% of the world's population. So any idea that's like, man, the world's just progressing. We're just getting Getting things better better all the time. It's like, no, no, it's just simply factually untrue. And Mm -hmm. so this viewpoint that things are going to just keep getting better is just logically flawed. It just doesn't work. And so... So this viewpoint, what type of life does it result in? Well, first of all, I think the world continues in this spiral of beauty and difficulty, right? We, we get planes that can take us all around the world. That's amazing. And then that speeds up the spread of a global uh, virus, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it's this constant difficulty, right? Uh, And from time to time, right, there's some reforms or these revolutions that we think, okay, well, this is going to solve everything. And we all know it doesn't. Right. Um, Personally, this this way of living, I think, will result in frustration. Frustration that I can't fix it, man. I Mm -hmm. keep trying. Or anxiety, because like that humanist manifesto said, like, no God is going to save us. We have to do it ourselves. That puts a great deal of yes. burden on our shoulders. Mm-hmm. And you can see that sometimes in the activism around us. Right. That there's such a good desire to make things better. And yet there's this burden of if I don't do this, the world will end. And I think that that's what you see behind some of just the almost violent, like just putting them whole selves into it because they truly believe if they don't fix it, it's not going to get fixed. So it's all up to them. That's a lot of pressure. Right. These are big problems. Right. Exactly. And so if we're on our own, that's going to be really, really challenging. I think one of the, the things is that um, while we can find some gratitude in the things we can change, I think the result is often we end up jaded mm-hmm. and kind of like disintegrated. We feel like, okay, well, I know, like, I, for enough years, I've kept trying, and, man, I just can't fix things. And so what do I do? Like, I guess I, I'm going to keep posting stuff on social media <laughs> because I want to look like I care, but I, I don't know if I can take that action. I don't know if I can show up to that next thing because I don't, I don't really feel like it's going to fix things. Or you get to the point of, like, I've tried, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I can't. And so what I need to do is just focus on, again, working my way up the corporate ladder and getting a nicer car, like that becomes kind of my life goal. Right. Well, I think you and I even talked about this earlier this week as we brainstormed about how the younger generations are seen as idealistic. They're still fighting for change, but sometimes as they get older, it's just like, you know what? (laughs) It's just not worth the effort because no matter what I do, Mm -hmm. it never makes a lasting change. So I'm just going to focus on me and what's good for me. Mm -hmm. And you see that sometimes in the older generations, it just doesn't want to engage because it's like, I have worked on this for 30 years and it's not changing. So I'm just going to focus on yeah. my world, my, you know, whatever's going to be good for me right now, because that I have at least apparent control over. Right. Yeah. How heartbreaking is that? You know, this sense of like, uh, you only are going to want to make change when you're younger and you have the more quote, quote unquote, mature people saying, ah, that doesn't all, that doesn't work. Like yeah. <laughs> you're just wasting your time. Like that's, that's a heartbreaking reality of the current state of our, of our society. So, mm-hmm. okay. So that's kind of the viewpoint. Linda, yes. what does scripture have to say about all of this? About a bit. mainstream culture? Yes, it does. <laughs> Take us there. Let's go. So I actually want to start with a passage out of the book of Colossians. Um, Paul wrote this and it's in Colossians one, it's verses 19 and 20. And it says this, for God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. The him refers to Jesus and through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, what this passage, first of all, says is that all things need to be reconciled, which is another way of saying everything 
Nothing works the way it's supposed to. Everything requires reconciling. Everything on earth and in heaven. So mainstream culture is actually getting this right. Something, everything is broken. Things are not working the way God intended. So this state of discord that mainstream culture is kind of frustrated with, the Bible fully acknowledges. Now, what's interesting is in this passage, the word reconciling, it has the sense of bringing back a former state of harmony or bringing into alignment. And again, this urge or this feeling that mainstream culture is expressing, like we want to make it right, we want to bring it into alignment, they're right on. It, it's out of alignment and they want to see it corrected. But the challenge for mainstream culture is this belief that whatever the problem is, however you define it, the sense that we can fix it. That quote that you referred to earlier about, no God is going to help us, we're going to have to do this ourselves. Well, if it's true <laughs> that, you know, what's wrong is our schools or our laws or it's poverty or the lack of education, you know, mainstream culture is saying then by sheer force of will, we can make it better. But the problem is that we are part of the problem. And you alluded to that a little bit. Um, you know, the Bible makes numerous references to the fact that we are broken just like the world is broken. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that, that we are incapable of restoring to this ought because we are part of the problem. We are not what we ought to be, right? So the reality that we see in this passage is only Jesus who shows up carrying the fullness of God um, that has the sense of the fact that he is in very nature God himself. It's a discussion for another day, but suffice to say that Jesus is God and he brought all of who that is with him when he came into the world. Only Jesus carrying the fullness of God can make what's wrong right. We need him to make things right. And the Bible's clear that it was only the death of God's son that could make this possible. Nothing less than that would be sufficient to bring about the change that this world really needs. Yeah. So again, like check this out. So for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through Jesus to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, right? So again, things on earth, things in heaven are not reconciled. They're not in harmony. They're like a guitar where like all the strings are out of key and you try to strum and it's terrible. Um, and then it says this, he's reconciling all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, how exactly he brings peace through his blood shed on the cross is again, a topic for another time. But what an amazing picture that we need God himself right. to come and save us is what scripture has to say. Yeah. Um, and you know, what's interesting is this part about all things being reconciled to himself. It's this, it's this picture kind of of a, of a plumb line. So a plumb line is like this weight on a string that you hang and it gives you a sense of, it uses gravity to give a straight line. So as you're right. building a house, you know, what is the plumb line? Yeah. What's true. What is, yeah, you true it up to that line. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of reconciling things, bringing things back into harmony this is another challenge with mainstream culture, um, according to scripture, is that when we want to make things just, when we want to make things beautiful, when we want to make things um, in a place of equality, the challenge with this is that if we're doing that apart from God, what is our plumb line? Right. We, we don't know what we can point this to. We don't know what we're truing it up to. And so scripture itself says that he is reconciling it all back to himself. Right. He's the plumb line. He's what's true. Right. And exactly. I think apart from God as your plumb line, this is why it can change from generation to generation because they're truing up to their best estimation of what good is. Right. And this is why revolution upon revolution and apparently we just keep these cycles, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. the world is still broken. So, um, okay. So conclusion is the world is broken. And we are perpetually frustrated that we are hopeless to fix it. That's really what it comes down to, right? If you enter into this space, that's what it's going to feel like. And 
look, you may be deeply influenced by this view. As you're sitting here listening to this, you may be saying, you know what? I am deeply influenced by this view of mainstream culture if... Here are just a few examples. First off, if you put your hope for humanity in that political figure or that political movement. Now, that isn't saying you shouldn't care about those things. Right. But if you're putting your hope for all of humanity in that, and that shows up in how you feel about these things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if all is lost because you didn't win the election or all is lost because that political movement ran out of steam, man, you're probably carrying the weight of feeling like fixing the world is on your shoulders. I think sometimes people in the church have that same sort of struggle. And I think we've seen that over the last several years here is that participation is important. But if your person doesn't get in, if your law doesn't get passed the way you want it to, it is not the end of the world because the weight of fixing the broken world is not on you. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think sometimes even people in the church get sucked into this feeling like, well, if this doesn't pass, then it's over. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not actually true. Yeah. There's a God involved right. <laughs> in right. all of this. And we sometimes fall into this secular humanist viewpoint without even noticing it going, no, but if this doesn't happen, and sometimes we have to remember, wait, God is working in this. Right. And that's not to say we shouldn't, and we'll get into that next. But um, here's the thing. If you believe that things are just going to keep getting better and better, if we just keep trying harder, again, you're probably a little bit over-influenced by this, mm -hmm. this point of view. Uh, or I should just say deeply influenced by this point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, if you find yourself in that tension between wanting the world to change and realizing that you're helpless to do so, and that's bringing just this like difficulty and this pain, mm -hmm. I feel that pain. Yeah. I feel that. Um, every day as I read the news, I think, mm. oh, I wish we could just fix this. Um but that usually means that we're being influenced by this mainstream culture. Not the desire to make things right, but this desire to say, I want to make things right, and gosh, I feel hopeless to mm -hmm. do so, and that's bringing about frustration. Absolutely. All right. Well, there it is. Mainstream culture. Let's now dive into... Churchianity. Let's do this. So how does churchianity respond to this claim that the world is broken? And again, there are different views within churchianity, but the one that we've seen most frequently is that the world is bad and it just needs to be abandoned. Yes, exactly. And so, again, we could dive into every different kind of stream of thought in this, but um, in this, it's this idea that, that we need to escape the world. Mm -hmm. It's bad, it is corrupted, and our involvement in the world will corrupt us. So the world is not just broken, it's bad. Um, it's evil. And we need to abandon it. So we're not about fixing it, we just need to get away from it. Um, this, If you want to read a little bit more about this viewpoint, uh, from a really good kind of um, neutral place, uh, Richard Niebuhr wrote a book, um, and in it, he mentions this as the Christ against culture viewpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but the book title will put that all in the show notes and everything. Now, essentially, the idea is that this world is hopelessly corrupted. That since the fall, right, since Adam and Eve rebelled against God, the natural world, along with the human mind and heart, and as well as all of society, all of the cultural stuff that we create, all of it is irreconcilably broken. Mm. That the reign of evil has taken over the world and it is at full power. And to be in the world is to be corrupted by the world. Right. So the solution for us is to flee, to escape, to cloister with other Christians and build Christian-specific communities. Now, this point of view has actually been held even throughout Jewish history sure. into Christian history. So it's first held by a group of people called the Essenes, which... Uh, would be most closely related to like a John the Baptist who, you know, was out in the desert, kind of away from everyone. The people, the Essene people were certain that the world was corrupted. So we're going to go build our own little desert communities. This is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, were mm -hmm. written by the Essenes. And the viewpoint was, well, the world's going to burn. Uh, so we need to just get away from it and we can be purified. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. This then continued into a lot of the monastic movements in medieval Europe. 
that as they looked at the world around them, they're like, this is all corrupted, and the bishops are just taking money as they're ruling over this area. They're just doing it for political powers. We're going to start our own little monastic community, you know, the Benedictine monks. Um, and so monks and nuns, this was kind of the idea. We're going to get away from the world. We're going to do our Christian thing, and we're going to study. We're going to pray, and that's what we're going to need to do is to get away from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then this has also influenced a lot of the streams of, like, Mennonites and Quakers and Amish sure. um, that we see right now. Yeah, the, just this feeling that, you know, the world, we know that it's sinful and broken. And so if we cloister ourselves away from it, we have a better chance of remaining holy and doing mm. what God's called us to do. And this way of being and this way of thinking about the brokenness in the world um, in the pursuit of holiness and in the name of I've been set apart by God, so now I'm going to be set apart, um, they are leaning on verses. I mean, it's not a completely random thing. They are leaning on some verses. Some of them lean on First John 2, 17, where it says, don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love, love of the world squeezes out the love of the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from Him. I mean, in other words, it's all, this is bad, and it's going to, the love of the Father it has nothing to do with him. So why would I want to be a part of it? Revelation 18, 4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. You know, it's kind of this cooties view of <laughs> the evil in the world. It's like if you're near it, it might get on you. Yep. Um, I remember even when I was growing up, my mom saying to me, Avoid the appearance of evil. Don't look like it. Don't, if, you know, if a certain style of clothing is associated, don't wear the clothes. Mm -hmm. If a certain kind of music, don't listen to that music. Mm -hmm. If, you know, if it's a certain kind of people go to that place, don't go to that place. It was very much like, if I went, I might get infected. Right. And it would draw me away. Mm -hmm. Right. So the answer wasn't, wasn't try to navigate that. It was stay away. Right. Exactly. And so this, you, you may be recognizing this, that, that passage from Revelation 18, 4, you know, you have Babylon, the city of evil, kind of representing all that is evil in our world. And it's saying, come out, come out of that city. And so this viewpoint would say, okay, I actually need to come out yeah. of the city. Um, now, in the end, this is kind of the interesting thing. And in the, the viewpoint would hold that God will eventually completely destroy the world, a delete all kind of idea, mm-hmm. everything in it, all of the culture, all the everything, nature, everything. This is kind of the, it's all going to hell in a handbasket viewpoint. Um, and so the viewpoint then is that nothing here really matters. They, they take a passage from Second uh, Peter 3.10 about the world being refined by fire and make it about really God just destroying everything. And so the story along this line is that since Adam and Eve all is lost, God is at work to separate a remnant a group of people, the church, and he's going to save some, and the rest of it is going to destruction. We're just like listing out what this viewpoint is. So our job as Christians within this viewpoint is to live uncorrupted by the world and its ways and to convince others to join our communities. Right. And so art, film, culture, music, all of it is under the reign of evil and rooted mm-hmm, in worshiping mm-hmm. the idols of this world. So being involved in any of that is loving the ways of this world. It should not be engaged with. Furthermore, it's going to burn anyway. So that's just kind of a waste of time if you're going to kind of engage in those things. Sure. Um, And in the same way, justice and equality and environmental care and cultural progress, none of it matters. You know, it's kind of a worthless attempt. It's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. (laughs) It's all going down. Right. Right. And look, if we are going to engage with those things, it's kind of as like a spy action to just get a few more people onto the life raft. Mm -hmm. And so then in this view, you've probably seen this, there's kind of like this Christian subculture and that's the only one that matters. So we have Christian movies and Christian sports and Christian books and Christian music. We make a Christian version of NSYNC, you know, or Christian video (laughs) games. And we do that to say, okay, well, in our own little cloistered community, we're going to, you know, give some nice stuff to kind of keep people in this community and keep it engaged that way. So the positive in how this plays out. First off, culture is corrupted. 
Like, we, we know that. You don't need to look around very long to be blown away by just how baseless and philosophically thin so much of our media um, is today. Like, sure. it's, it's, it's building up anger and division and um, fear, and we just think, Ugh. yeah, it makes sense to try to stay away from it. Absolutely. And in my own experience, a lot of this is true. What your what your mom raised you to, you know, believe. It, I've seen this to be true. When people sure. are like, "Well, I'm just going to go be in the world and spread love and bring joy," and they just dive headfirst into the world, uh, the result is usually that they become very shaped by it. You know, sure. a bad company gr- corrupts good character. Scripture right. says, and. Often it's to the d- demise of their relationships and their mental health and their spiritual health. And look, again, evil is at work in the world. And this viewpoint says, yeah, we can actually, this viewpoint th- says, of course, genocide happens. This world is hopelessly, irreconcilably evil. Right. So, of course, there is just deep systemic racism. That's because this world is hopelessly and helplessly evil. And so it is able to kind of name the depths of the brokenness of our world in the way that I think mainstream culture can't. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it also names our inability to fix it all. The idea is just abandon it all, run away from it, escape from it. Um, We are fallible, we are broken, and God is the only one who can save. And to that I say, amen. Right. That's right. Now, there are some challenges, though, with this viewpoint. First, first bit is that um, this this viewpoint is kind of the history behind all of the prohibitions that sure. Christians have become known for. You know that we sometimes are known more for what we are against than what we are for. Mm-hmm. That's this thing. Don't mm-hmm. go to that movie. Don't listen to that music. Don't, don't, don't. Um, and it's like, what are you, what are you here for? You right. know, besides just saying don't do any of these bad things and this view almost inevitably becomes the frozen chosen so <laughs> i've got my group of people we are together in our little holy huddle as it's called and we don't really care much for the world as it burns like let it burn who cares we've got our little group of christians and to hell with them essentially yeah, i don't think they think they're saying that but by the behavior i think that that's mm-hmm. what's happening right Yeah, so again, if we jump into the creation of Christian-specific movies or music. And those things aren't bad. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, they're they're great. I love Christian music. Christian movies are wonderful. But Mm. when they're being used as a way to disengage from the world, then, you know. Absolutely. While that can very much be uplifting to Christians to bring beauty and quality and depth into the world. Right. So that's that's a slightly different picture. That doesn't say, well, to hell with the world. It says we care. You know, right. we're going to use our creativity and our art um, for that. And this is, I think, at the core of it, uh, one of the major challenges of this viewpoint is that it departs from so much of our Christian heritage. Mm-hmm. The heritage that resulted in some of the greatest art and science yeah. and the movement of, hey, we're going to educate people we're going to create hospitals. Like all of that was yeah. the church. That was us saying, we're not going to say to hell with the world. Right. We are going to stand there and serve this world with the love of Jesus in all of these aspects. And, you know, that that is a challenge that this viewpoint results in a, a group of people that are not engaging as creators. Um, we simply are kind of a, a running away people. So, um. I, I think this viewpoint forgets the commissioning of Genesis 1, 26 mm-hmm. through 28, mm-hmm. that we are to reign and rule over this earth, that we are to take care of it and yeah. tend to it um, in culture, in nature itself. Like we are meant to care for these things. And this viewpoint says, well, it's, it's going to burn. So why should I plant a tree? Um, <laughs> and then I, I would say this at, at, at its core, this viewpoint is narrow in its scope, and it's more of a retreating religion than a victorious one. Mm. I don't know how this reflects the resurrected king. Um, you know, there's that verse that says the gates of hell will not stand. Yeah. The gates are defensive things. Right. This viewpoint would kind of feel like these gates are just slowly increasing yeah. more and more. <laughs> They're but coming towards us. Yeah. And we gotta- 
No, but scripture is saying the gates of hell will not stand. Like we need to be charging, charging into right. evil uh, to bring God's love. Okay. So what does this result in? Well, there is a safety and consistency in sticking to traditional practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a community that comes when I'm just around people who agree with me, right? Yeah. If I'm cloistered, that's great. Now, it also results, though, you could probably figure, in a lot of judgmentalism yeah. about them. It's tribalism, their people, my people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's very little practice of empathy, right? The resulting viewpoint can be quite selfish. I was... <laughs> I was watching a Seinfeld the other day, um, and there was that bit when uh, Elaine is dating this guy, David Putty, and she finds out David is a, is a Christian, and she says, doesn't this bother you that I'm not a Christian? And he says, it's not my problem. I'm not the one going to hell. <laughs> and uh, Yikes. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's kind of the viewpoint, right? It's kind of like, well, it's not my problem. Like, that's, that's just your decision, and I have no responsibility or care to engage with you in that way. And so uh, we can end up becoming apathetic to the needs of this world, to the brokenness of this world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or we can become fearful of, man, this, I, my purity is going to be destroyed by the ever-increasing power of the broken culture. Sure. So I'm running away, and I just I need to keep myself clean and pure. And if we do engage with this view, it's only to bring people over to our side. Right, right, right. Right? Yep. It's like, I might engage with the world, but it's only to just pull you over to my side and then you can be part of my holy huddle. Mm -hmm. you know? And how does that feel for the people? Like, it's like, you don't love me. I'm some agenda yeah, item for I'm you. I'm a project. Thank you. Right, right. Yeah. And it's like, and all of, it becomes very, um, like everything is about how I'm going to get you yeah. To say the prayer, cross the line, come mm -hmm. over to our side, because where you are is terrible, where right. I am is good. Mm -hmm. And that, again, that actually becomes off-putting for people, because mm -hmm. they know if you're coming, you're coming not to love them or care for them. You're coming to drag them across the line to your right. side. It's like, oh, and this the, is not good. <laughs> people at the viewpoint would say, well, I am loving them by trying to grab them into the, the life raft. Um, however, when we talk about love, as we'll get to uh, when we dig into Jesus, it's it's... I think a much more holistic way. Yeah, for sure. So what does for scripture sure. have to say about churchianity? So I'm going to go back to Colossians 1 and we'll read it through again, just so it's fresh. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So we know what this passage said to mainstream culture and how it challenged it. What does it say to churchianity? Well, Again, we said that the fullness of God is in Jesus. And what is he going to do? He's going to reconcile all things to himself. So it recognizes it's broken and it requires God to fix it. Um, but there's a couple of things that we want to notice. First of all, Jesus says he's going to reconcile, not destroy everything and start all over again. Right. right? So that's the first thing. And yes, there are things that will be burned up and destroyed. There are things that represent the sin and the brokenness that will all go away in order to reconcile things to God, to the plumb line that is God. But what this passage reminds us is that the world and our relationship is not, it's not irreconcilable such that the only option is just to destroy it. I mean, if it's completely irrecon irreconcilable, then there is no other option but to let it just be destroyed. It's going to be reconciled. It's going to be restored. So churchianity says there are irreconcilable differences. Run. This verse says it can be reconciled. And the good news is that it will be. Right. So real quick on that, like think about a relationship. Um, if you get to the point where the relationship is irreconcilable, that's the end of the relationship. That right. relationship is done. And churchianity would say, yeah, that's what's going on with the world. God's just going to create, destroy, and then just create a new world. Right. Um. And kind of ex nihilo, right? Just out of nothing. He's right. going to delete it all and then start something new. And this passage is saying, no, he's going to reconcile all things. Mm -hmm. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, earth and heaven being reconciled together. So what we see in Revelation 21, 22, mm -hmm. that like that is the work he is going to do. That the relationship has, the relationship can be reconciled. And the beautiful good news is it will be. Absolutely. Thanks to Jesus. <sighs> Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's what's interesting. So Jesus is the reconciler. But then 
Paul writes something really interesting in 2 Corinthians 5.20. In that passage, we are given the ministry of reconciliation. So Jesus is the reconciler, and by his work in and through us, we become reconcilers. We have a part to play in reconciliation, and this clearly challenges churchianity. So we're not to abandon the world, but the way that we live in the world, by that, we become these agents of reconciliation. Right. Yeah, I love that. So it's not, let me run away. Um, we get to be a part of somehow tuning up that guitar. Right. That Jesus is doing, but somehow we become ministers of this reconciliation. We are showing it. We are doing it in, in making things right and aligned again with him. Now, okay. As you're hearing this, you're thinking, okay, I definitely got some of this in my blood. Let's ask. Okay, you may be deeply influenced by this view if. If you have zero care about the way that this world is heading, mm -hmm. if you pick up a newspaper and nothing in your heart flutters, if there's no like, oh, that's painful that those people are going through that. If it's kind of like, well, you know, it's all going to burn it's anyways. It's not here it and it's matter. not me and it's. <laughs> exactly. And so along with that, you know, you also may be deeply influenced by this view. If your whole hope right now is to just get out of here. Right. You know, I just want to see it all burn. If that's your viewpoint, you've probably been influenced deeply by this, by this um, point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is that you likely, maybe you haven't read or watched or talked about or listened to anything by a non-Christian in the last month or two. Yeah. Uh, if that's your space, let me just place before you a few examples. How about Paul in Athens when mm -hmm. he is talking to the Athenians? He quotes uh, Greek philosophers. Right. In him we live and move and have our being. He's quoting philosophers in that verse. He had to know what was going on with these people who didn't follow Jesus uh, so that he could actually have a conversation with them about the resurrection. And, you know, we see this with, with some of the great Christian leaders of our time. Um, you know, our own Pastor Rick. Mm -hmm. On the weekend, you'll hear him talk in the language of the people that are showing up. Yep. Uh, why? Because he's engaging with what's going on in the world around him. Sure. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, we are all having some voices speaking into us that are not, um, that are not always agreeing with us. Right, right. So that we can, so that we can save them. So that we can save some. This is what Paul would say. That we right. were going to have. Go ahead. I become all things to all men so that by some means, some might be saved. You know, it's it's just this idea that, that yeah, I am I have to know who they are and what they're thinking and, and what they're going through. Otherwise, we become irrelevant to them. Right. We're not speaking to them in a language they understand. That's right. And so, finally, you may be overly influenced by this view if you don't know anyone who doesn't follow Jesus. And if your entire community agrees with you, it's probably not a healthy spot to be in. <laughs> and you've probably been deeply influenced by this view. Yep. Yep. All right. Churchianity, Dunzo. Let's now talk about who. What does Jesus have to say about all of this? Yes. And what Jesus says in response to this claim is that, yes, the world is broken, but I love it and I am redeeming it. So the passage I want to focus us on for a moment is um, pretty familiar. It's John 3, 16 and 17. And the context of this is that Jesus is sitting with Nicodemus. He's one of Israel's teachers. Nicodemus has come at night. He's the original Nick at night. Um, and he... That's a good one. <laughs> hey, thank you. You know. Does anyone... The, the people... I mean, I know what Nick at night is. Yeah. Is that a thing still? I don't know. But it was when my kids were little. <laughs> Okay, I'm showing my age. Shh. But Jesus says to Nicodemus, you know, Nicodemus is like, you know, what do I have to do? <laughs> you know, what's going on? And, and this is what Jesus says. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we often turn to this verse and say, well, that means that for God so loved all people, all the people in the world. But if you... <laughs> If you actually go and look up the word that's used in the original language, it's something, it's the word cosmos, which is the world and everything in it. Yes, the people, but it's more than that. God so loved the created world and everything in it 
that he came and he shed his blood to reconcile, as that other passage in Colossians we've been looking at, to reconcile everything on earth and in heaven to himself. And then in verse 17, Jesus takes it even a step further. And he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So just think about that for a minute. He didn't come to condemn and say, this place is horrible and broken and we've just got to get rid of it. He came to save it. Yeah, save the whole cosmos, which again is talking about all of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nature, we as people, and even the the cultures that we have created, the the beautiful things about our ethnic makeup and the foods and the flavors, the art pieces, the the beauty, the traditions that we have, all of these things are wrapped up in this word cosmos. And the beauty of it is that Jesus is coming to save it. It's mm-hmm. not all going to burn. Mm-hmm. Um, in some miraculous way, he did not come to just condemn it and destroy it, but he came to save it. Mm-hmm. So look, there's, there's challenge with churchianity and mainstream culture, both of them shown in this passage, right? Um, it On the churchianity side, he didn't just come to destroy it. Um, and then on the mainstream culture side, it is Jesus who's doing the saving, right? not us. And so how, this is interesting, how does Jesus actually save the world? What, what's, what is that mission there? How does he do this? And then how can we be a part of it? So Jesus came as the prophesied Messiah, Mm -hmm. the king that was in the line of David that would rule the world and bring about everlasting peace. His rule would make all things right the way no other king has ever done. So that was the promise, is that someone in the line of David, some king would come and rule and make things truly just and beautiful and good and set all things that are broken, he would set it right. Now, Jesus picks up that prophecy, and Mm -hmm. in fact, that was the core of his message. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, go and read those and ask yourself, what is the core message he shares? Mark 1, 15, the very first thing Jesus says in the book of Mark is this. It says, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. What is the good news? Listen to this. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So the good news is that this kingdom of God, where what God wants to happen will fully happen, that is the good news, that that will come, and things will no longer be broken. All things will be made right. And Jesus' call is to say, hey, it's come near. It's, it's, It's here, guys, and what you need to do is repent. Turn away from all of the other kings and idols that you're following Believe this good news. Come and join. Be citizens of this new kingdom that's at work to make all things right. Mm -hmm. In essence, a new king was in town. And the question is, will you be a part of his kingdom? And this kingdom was not something that he was just going to, at the end of all time, bring. He said in, in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Right. It's here now. It's here. Now, it's not fully done. We know in Revelation 21 and 22 that all things will be made right, that when Jesus returns as the inaugurated king, there will be a time he comes back and every tear will be wiped away. Mm -hmm. Every bit of injustice will be judged. Every bit of inequality will be made right. That We know that someday that will come. So what do we do in this in-between? What's going on right now Mm -hmm. in this saving project that Jesus has done? Well, the kingdom is breaking into this world, and we catch glimpses of it in Jesus, what he's doing when he's healing, Mm -hmm. when he is loving the outsider, when he is giving food to those that are hungry. What he's doing in all of those things is he's showing glimpses of what it looks like when God is in charge. He's saying, I am the king, and I'm making things right. Someday I'll make it perfectly right. But right now I'm going to give you glimpses of it. And 
you know, as we reviewed Jesus's teaching, kind of getting ready for this episode, what stood out to me is that he rarely, he did explain how to be saved, but that was not the bulk of his message. Disproportionately more often, he talked about the way we live in the world that points to the gospel, to the reign of Jesus as king. And he actually pointed to a passage of scripture in Luke as sort of his mission statement. He's in, Jesus is in Nazareth, which is his hometown, and he's in the synagogue, and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah, and it's Luke 4, and it says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to do what? To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So his ministry, yes, it is a saving and reconciling ministry, but that's going to happen through his interaction with the people and meeting the needs of the people around him in the culture that he was living in. Yeah. So again, if we look at him, if we look at Jesus' life, at the ministry he did, sometimes we just jump straight to the crucifixion and resurrection. Right. That's what he did for us. But we need to look at his life and teachings because what they did is they they were this reconciling work. And if we look at what Jesus is doing through the lens of Colossians 1, we see he was reconciling. When, we, when he gave sight to the blind, what he's doing is he's saying, this wrong is being made right. Mm-hmm. This wrong mm-hmm. in your life is being made right. When, when he's handing a, a cup of cold water to the Samaritan woman, what he's doing is he is fulfilling this need in the Samaritan woman's life. He's showing what it looks like when Jesus is in charge, when people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds can find some uh, place to to be together and to be able to connect and be a, a family. There, uh, when he stands with those that are marginalized, the tax collectors, the, the quote-unquote sinners, um, it wasn't just because, well, that's a need and I just need to fill it. It was all of this mission to say, I'm giving you an idea of what mm-hmm. it looks like when God is in charge. And then think about all of his teaching. What was it? The kingdom of God is like... The kingdom of God is like, this is what he was teaching all the time. So he's teaching it in his actions and in his words. And then the crazy thing is when he leaves, he gives us that opportunity. He gives us who follow him the opportunity to continue to give glimpses of what it looks like when God is in charge. So that's how we play a part in the making right of this broken world. As uh, Ed Stetzer says in Subversive Kingdom, he says, We take part in kingdom work, quote, not only when we proclaim his saving gospel, but when we confront injustice, when we touch human need, when we seek to bring about changes that transform this world to look more like it will be when Jesus returns. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. We get to be a part of showing little glimpses of what it looks like. Now, hear me on this. This isn't about us putting our efforts together to bring the kingdom as if all of us Christians are just going to force the kingdom into existence. Right. That would be the same basic error as mainstream culture. Exactly. At that yeah. Right. And that's what showed up in Christendom and right. what happened in the early, early church. Um, well, under like Constantine and beyond. And so it's not us. It's not going to just slowly keep getting better. And then Jesus is going to show up and be like, well done everyone. <laughs> No, someday Jesus will come back and make it all right. It's on him to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not on us to do that. But we get to be glimpses of what that kingdom looks like. And it kind of shows up like this. In Gladiator, (laughs) Maximus says, it's a great, great scene. He says, what we do in life echoes in eternity. Yeah. So good, right? Mm -hmm. And Paul actually agrees. He has this entire chapter in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection, about the work God's going to do to make all things right when he returns, that he's going to clothe the mortal with immortality. He's going to clothe the perishable with imperishableness. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the word, but he's going to do that amazing work. And then he ends at the very end of this whole chapter. That's so mind blowing. It's like, so what does this mean for us? Paul says, so wait around until he makes it. No, he doesn't say that. (laughs) No. No. He says, therefore, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord 
Check this out. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Yeah. So somehow, God is going to make all things right. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, fully restored new creation. And somehow the work we do right now will not be in vain. I think of it like a, a stonemason where somebody's building a cathedral and you're given the job to just shape these stones. You're going to polish them. You're going to sand them down. You're going to shape them. You don't know where they're going to be going. You don't know exactly how it's going to be a part of that cathedral, but you can be certain it will be. Yeah. So when God makes all things right, our efforts, that giving a cup of cold water to someone who is thirsty, that loving of your neighbor, that planting of a tree, the caring for our nature, somehow, somehow that will be redeemed and restored and a part of the work that Jesus does when he makes all things right. I love that. So if people are listening and going, okay, okay, I'm in. I'm kind of beginning to get this. What does it look like to give glimpses of the kingdom, like what you're talking about? And when Jesus talked about this, he used a metaphor that many are probably familiar, and that is the, Im the images of salt and light. So he talked about this in Matthew 5, um, verses 13 to 15. This is what Jesus said. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Then he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and give, it gives light to everyone in the house. Then in verse 16, it just says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So let's let's just explore this for a minute. What does salt do? What what is the function of salt? It does two things. It preserves and it gives flavor. I mean, we know this, right? So when you starting with its preserving function, interestingly enough, when you look up like synonyms for the word preserve, you get words like protect, maintain, take care of. So we are the salt of the earth. We help preserve. It sounds very much like the mandate given to Adam in the garden to take care of it and tend it. So that's preserving. It also gives flavor. Um, you can put salt on something that's sweet and it'll actually make it taste sweeter. You can take the edge off something sour by adding salt. However, think about this for a minute. Salt on the side of your plate or in the salt shaker does absolutely no good. It's got to be in your food, mixed in, thoroughly distributed to be able to do that for which it was designed. If it's all on the side of the plate or not in your food at all, it doesn't. I mean, the presence of salt doesn't do it. It's got to so be good. mixed in. Yeah. <laughs> so that's salt. Um, now we have light. Jesus says it's by our deeds that people will see and glorify God. So the work that we do, the way that we live, our engagement in and with the world, it's that light that will cause people to turn towards God. If you've ever been in a really, really dark room and you see just a pinpoint of light, mm -hmm. all of your attention goes to it. I mean, you can't help it. Mm -hmm. It's so, I mean, it's just, you look immediately at it and it, it captures your gaze. Mm -hmm. And that is what we're called to do. In the midst of the darkness around us, we're to shine. How do we shine? By the, the deeds that we're doing, by living in and amongst the culture that we have as salt. Mm -hmm. so that we become light. So I think where we want to go now is what does this actually look like in 2022, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> I mean, what does it look like to be salt and light? And I think if we go back to the example of Jesus and looking what, not just what Jesus said, but also what he did, like what, what did Jesus say about living in the world? Well, for, of course, we have the great commission, go and make disciples and bring people into the family of God, of course, but there's also the great commandment and that's telling us to love God, heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others, love your neighbor as yourself. And so that others love others as yourself, that others isn't qualified. It's not like others who agree with you or others who are like you or others who you feel comfortable around. It's just others. It's everybody else. In other words, we have to find ways to live out love and compassion and mercy and justice and forgiveness and kindness. And we do that in our communities, at our schools, in our workplaces. 
we have to engage the world as we find it. Absolutely. Right? When we think about in 2022, what are we supposed to be doing? Well, any of our actions that can show this is what it looks like when things are reconciled with God. So what does that look like in how you treat your actual neighbor? Right. Like your actual neighbor. Think about that. What does it look like in how you garden in your in your backyard? <laughs> what does it look like in how you stand up for what's right in mm. some of the brokenness in our world? Um, how does it look like on social media as right. you are posting and trying to share ideas? Share the ideas of this is what it looks like when, when God is in charge. I get to live my life that way. But do it in a way that reflects the love and compassion and mercy. And I think this is, we kind of hit on this a little bit earlier, but sometimes we come at this with the intent, I want to show the truth, but behind that is if I don't show it, nobody's going to see it. And, you know, everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. Whereas if we communicate and speak into those places, we need to do that, but we need to do it with love, Mm -hmm. with compassion. Mm -hmm. We need to do it with, in our head, if Jesus was sitting next to us, would he kind of face palm and go, oh my goodness. (laughs) Or would he be like, yeah, exactly. You know, would he come alongside and and agree? Or would he be like, that, that wasn't what I meant. Yeah. Well, the what and how are both showing Jesus as king. Right. Or something else as king. Sure. So what are we standing up for and how do we stand up for it? Both of those will show mm-hmm. who is king in our lives mm-hmm. and both will show the world some other idol is in charge, some other king, um, or what it looks like when Jesus is in charge. Okay. Okay. So let's close this up. What does this realistically result in if we buy into this viewpoint? If we say, yes, Jesus, I want to be a part of this I'm not going to solve the world and its brokenness. I know you will. And in the meantime, I get to reflect like an angled mirror, right? I'm reflecting your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, Mm. right? That's what we get to do in this viewpoint. What does this result in? Well, first off, we we are honest about this world. We know that it is broken. We can also have a sustained hope about wrongs being made right, that when we see things that are broken in this world, we're going to say, we can be a part of the solution, but solving this problem in its entirety is not on me. And that results actually in a, in a um, open-handed way of living. Man, I, I get to be a part of uh, pointing to Jesus' reign. So like when I give somebody that cup of cold water, I can do that and know, okay, I don't have to solve every problem behind that. Now, if God calls me to, I will continue to step into that. Sure. Um, But if I just ran into somebody for a moment and they needed something and I can give that to them, I can walk away saying, man, I presenced the kingdom. I showed a little bit what it looks like when Jesus is in charge. Because when Jesus is in charge, that person has what they need. Yeah. And man, I did that today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think in that that way... um, we continue in the mandate of naming what is evil in our world, mm-hmm. right? We can stand up and say, it is wrong that blank. Yep. But we get to do it, and even the evil inside us, by the way, you know, it is wrong mm-hmm. that blank. But we also have clarity about what to do about it. Yeah. There is a waiting and a hopeful expectation, like Romans 8 says, right? All creation groans and yearns for yes. things to be made right. Um. And so we get to be a part of that too, of yearning and groaning for things to be right, knowing the promise that one day creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and will be set free like we will be as well. Now, the other cool thing, if, if we step into this, we get to engage with culture. We get to love others with our art, with our creativity, with our business, with our science, with our all of this. We get to show again. God loves this stuff, and he loves us, and we get to show it in our efforts. Absolutely. And in that way, we get to be artists and legislators and musicians and creators and creation carers and justice seekers and business builders. We get to tend to our world the way God called Adam and Eve to do it. We have the standard, the one we are pointing to, and we know that somehow the work we do in these areas will be involved in the eternal new creation that he is going to do. And so the image there as Jesus people is that we have Jesus people in business, in government, 
in the art, in culture, in media, showing glimpses of God's love. love Isn't that a beautiful picture? Mm -hmm. We don't want to tear down these things. Mm -hmm. We want to bring God's reign into these places. Mm -hmm. And that's what we get to do. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap this up, you know, what does this look like to live it out? And I would, I would say maybe the first thing is that if there's a change you want to see, be engaged in that. But how does my response, how, how would this change reflect Jesus reign? And how am I in my response presencing God's kingdom? I don't, I know I don't have to fix it. I know that it's not on me to make it right. But if I choose to get involved in something, how am I representing God's kingdom here? How, how am I shining light? How am I being salt here? And mm -hmm. so that would, that could be one way. Whatever the issue or thing is that you're passionate about, be passionate. We need that. Desperately. But we need to do it in a way that presences his kingdom and doesn't just point back at us and make us all look crazy. <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, in so many ways, right? When we, again, realize we're not the ones to save the world. Jesus is going to save it then we get to walk into these areas where we want to see change and we get to do it without the weight on our shoulders that exactly. we're doing it on our own. And we get to do it with the power of the of Holy Spirit. <laughs> exactly. God is at work in this world and he loves you and he wants to make things right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be a part of that. I'm going to be a herald of his making right work right now. Love it. And so, yeah, if you're wanting to work towards the ought, wherever you are wanting to work towards the ought, Ask yourself, what is the characteristic of God that you can use as your standard, as your plumb line? So when you're thinking about justice, go to God and say, what does justice look like to God? Because that becomes my plumb line. That becomes what is true that mm -hmm. I can line things up to. When you want equality, what does that look like? Where, where in scripture does it talk about what equality is? Because that gives me a goal to chase after or at least right. to point to in whatever activities I live into. For sure. And then if you're listening, you're like, I want to dig into this more. I want to see kind of how I can do this. There's a really interesting passage in Jeremiah 29. Uh, most of us are familiar with 2911. But before that, um, this is written by Jeremiah to the people of Israel. They are now in captivity in Babylon. And so they are in a place that they do not want to be, that is potential, that is evil. It, they've been taken from their home. Their home is destroyed. I mean, they, they do not want to be there. And God has promised that good is coming, that relief is coming, that, that they will be restored back to their land. But in the meantime, God gives them some very interesting instructions. It's kind of a surprise when people read it. So I just encourage you to read those first 10 verses of Jeremiah 29 and see what you think. Yeah, and then you could keep reading on to 11. Yeah, you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for, uh, for having this conversation, Linda. Yeah, this was so much fun. Yeah. So much fun. It was thick and weighty, and I hope that this is helpful for all, all of our listeners and watchers out there that as you look at the brokenness of this world, you have a sense of, okay, I think I know how I can engage with it. My job is not that it's on me alone to just keep trying harder. On the other hand, it's not about just letting it all burn and I'm going to just cloister with other Christians and that's going to be the entirety of my existence. But you can say, no, Jesus has made us, has given us a way forward, that he is the new king. Mm -hmm. He is the king that's showing a different way of doing humanity and a different way for the world to work. And now we get to show that in our actions, in every little action, in the way that we love our spouse or kids, the way we love our neighbors, the way that we learn, the way that we care for this world. We get to show a little glimpse of what it looks like when God is in charge. And in that way, we become parts of the solution to this broken world. That is awesome. Thanks, Brandon. You guys, this has been a blast. So good to be with you. We will see you next time. The same hands that held me when I was made. The same hands that wrote my story of grace. The same hands that rolled the stone from the grave. Your hands are holding mine.